In the summer of 1969, script editor Terence Dix approached former colleague of his, Malcolm Hulk, seeking new story ideas for John Pertwee's third Doctor. Malcolm Hulk was initially reluctant to write a new script for the new format, as producers Peter Bryant and Derek Sherwin had reformatted Doctor Who in such a way that it was now effectively earthbound, and Hulk feared that this restricted the programme to adventures involving either alien invasions or mad scientists. Nonetheless, Malcolm Hulk decided to try and prove himself wrong, and developed an idea about a race of creatures who would be revealed as having inhabited the Earth millions of years before mankind even evolved. On June 15, 1969, Terence Dix commissioned the six-part serial from Hulk under the title of The Monsters. The story then gained a less generic name in The Silurians, and an extra episode was added around the time its scripts were greenlighted on August 11th. To this point, Hulk's adventure was intended to be the third serial of Season 7, coming after David Whittaker's The Ambassadors of Death. But when that story hit severe scripting difficulties, Terence elected to transpose the two in the running order, moving the Silurians up to second in production. Filming began on the Silurians a week late due to the industrial action that had affected Spearhead from Space to be recorded entirely outside the studio. Consequently, filming began on November 12th at locations in Marylebone, Shepherd's Bush, London, for the sequence in episode 6 where the Ill Masters arrives in the city and the plague starts to affect the whole population. The next two days were spent at Sheep Hatch Farm in Tilford, Surrey, which served as Squire's Farm. Publicity shots were also taken around this time of Bessie, the Doctor's new car, which made its debut in this story. Bessie was suggested to outgoing producer Peter Bryant by John Pertwee and assistant script editor Trevor Ray. Bessie was built in the style of an Edwardian roadster and bore a fake license plate reading Who Won. Because of John Pertwee's love for cars, it was his idea to bring Bessie into the series. After a break for the weekend, work resumed on the 17th and 18th at Hankley Common in Rushmore, Surrey, filling in for Wenley Moor. Wenley Hospital was actually Milford Chest Hospital in Milford, Surrey. Scenes there were filmed on November 19th. Finally, two more Surrey locations, the High Street in Godalming and the Hogback Transmitter Station in Guildford, played host to several scenes on the 20th of November. Amongst these were the sequences where the Doctor Watcher's unit blow up the Silurian Caves, a scene that was added by Terence Dix at Barry Letzer's request. Barry Letzer discovered from audience research reports that more than half of Doctor Who's viewers were now adults, and therefore sought to orient the programme in a more mature direction. Unfortunately, the filming of the explosion didn't go as planned and a small grass fire was ignited instead, forcing Trevor Ray to explain the mishap to the local fire department who had actually believed that a fire had gone off on the fields. Director Timothy Combe had contemplated visiting Wookie Hole for the cave scenes in Somerset. However, it soon became clear that this would not be logistically feasible, and so Timothy Combe elected to move those sequences into the studio. Now, unfortunately, this led to even more difficulties when designer Barry Newbury discovered that the outside contractors he had hired to build the cave set had made the walls far too flimsy to stand erect. As a result, it was decided to abandon Doctor Who's usual pattern of taping all the scenes for one episode each week. In a break with tradition, the story's title was given as Doctor Who and the Silurians. Although this was the style used on most Doctor Who scripts to this point, the Doctor Who and prefix had always been omitted from the title given on screen. Now, to avoid a recurrence of this error in the future, the prefix was largely dropped from subsequent scripts. Hence why we have the title of the story be Doctor Who and the Silurians. Producer Barry Letts felt that the usual one-week, one-episode pattern was now an inefficient method to film Doctor Who, and instead he thought that it might be better to tape two instalments together on a bi-weekly basis, since the sets could then be left up overnight, and this would reduce the amount of damage they incurred from being taken down and put back up again the next day. The story also included the first use of colour separation overlay, known as CSO, or for what we know now today, green screen. This was a new electronic effect in which elements of the image from one camera replaced areas of the image from a second camera which were keyed to a specific colour, either blue, green or yellow. Tests for this technique had been held as far back as August 6th and Barry Letts decided to use it as he saw enormous potential in its use. All the production out of the way, let's look at the story. Unit is called in when a nuclear reactor on Wenley Moor starts experiencing strange power losses. The Doctor discovers that the activation of the reactor has accidentally awakened the Earth's original civilised inhabitants, the Reptilian Silurians, 
who have lain in suspended animation underground for millennia. Now the Silurians wish to reclaim the planet for themselves and unleash a deadly virus that will engulf mankind and destroy them. Now, we're only two stories into this Earthbound format, and already Malcolm Hulk is attempting to break away from this restrictive formula. Because when you think about it, setting Doctor Who entirely on Earth only gives you two types of stories, mad scientist or alien invasion. Now, this subverts that story style and has the enemy be not from another planet, but from underneath the Earth itself. And from the Silurians' point of view, mankind is the invader, not them. Malcolm Hulk's script is filled with such subtext that keeps the story interesting across seven episodes. Furthermore, he keeps the story focused, but introduces new elements into each individual episode to keep the story fresh and moving forward. Each episode has its own mini subplot when you think about it. Episode 1 is investigating the power losses, Episode 2 looking in the caves, Episode 3 hunting for the wounded Silurian, Episode 4 investigating their base, Episode 5, Negotiations between the Doctor and the Silurians, Episode 6, Battling the Plague, and Episode 7, An Invasion of the Silurians to the Research Centre. Now this makes Doctor Who and the Silurians one of those stories that's pretty easy to watch all in one go, I think. So if you ever have to write something that's nearly three hours long, my advice would be watch this story if you want to keep the audience's interest, because in my opinion, it succeeds with flying colours. John Pertwee continues to shine in this story, and in my opinion, we're introduced to a Doctor who stands as the middleman between two species. The third Doctor doesn't seem as black and white as his two predecessors, and not just because he's in colour now, but he's out looking for a solution that could suit both sides. The last thing the Doctor wants here is a massacre and a terrible war that will result in either one's genocide. And my John Pertwee moment of the week is his scene in episode 5 with the Silurian leader. Major Baker, who is also held prisoner, is shouting how much of a traitor he is for telling the Silurians information about mankind. The look on Pertwee's face almost shows doubt about what he's doing, because at this point in the story, humans and Silurians have been attacked on both sides, and while the Doctor still thinks that peace is the best option, there is still vulnerability in his face because of the preceding events. However, he still presses on with his objective and even manages to persuade the Silurian leader that peace is the best option. The entire scene sums up the Doctor's character in my opinion, a bridge between two species who's always looking out for the best possible solution. I also love the scene where he first meets a Silurian in Quinn's cottage. He's aware that this reptile has attacked people, but understand that it's just most likely scared and just attacking in self-defense. The way he says hello and reaches his hand out in peace Speaking slowly and with compassion, it doesn't feel out of place at all, and Pertwee just sells the hell out of it. Doctor Who and the Silurians is where the third Doctor's character is born for me, dressing like a lord or member of the establishment, but being completely against the system. An example of him being kind of against the system is that he doesn't want the Brigadier and unit to invade the caves. His mere existence and knowledge of things beyond human understanding antagonises Dr. Lawrence, the leader of the research centre, and if the Doctor succeeded, he could have changed history as we know it. It's ironic when you think about it, as this is why he was sent to Earth in the first place, because of his interference. Pertwee has mastered the role completely here, in my opinion, and he exhibits the right mix of logic, arrogance, but also compassion that characterises the third Doctor, who is at the top of his game in this story. Liz Shaw also continues to be a good companion for the Doctor, and manages to make serious scientific contributions to the story such as analysing the blood sample that was found in the caves, searching the barn for forensic analysis, and helping the Doctor find a cure for the plague. While she does get the classic companion scream when the Silurian attacks her, she doesn't become scared or quiver with fear, she's completely cool about it and realises bigger things are at stake and we need to move on from this. She feels like such an equal to the Doctor. If something bad happens, she doesn't panic, she just takes it in her stride and moves on to help create the best solution that we can. The Brigadier, played by Nicholas Courtney, is also on top form here, and completely cold as he can get, and feels like a force to be reckoned with. This is only his second story with the third Doctor, but there's already conflict between the two, but you equally see his point of view when he regards the Silurians. He loses many men to them, and even nearly suffocates when they trap him and his men in the caves. While the Doctor is angry that the Brigadier blew up their base at the end, you can see where the Brigadier was coming from. Good people and soldiers died, and he can't risk the Silurians waking up again and causing havoc. 
The Doctor does criticise him for speaking like a soldier, but you can't really fault the Brigadier for that because the man is a trained killer and it's his job to think like a soldier and strategize. Nicholas Courtney completely owns this character and I personally feel that season 7 was the character and the actor's best series as the Brigadier kind of became a comical figure in later years but here I think they mixed just the right balance. There was definitely a respect for the Doctor but there was also the Brigadier's own interests and authority that he had to answer to which the Doctor on Earth doesn't have an authority to answer to but the Brigadier is kind of the one to rein him in on that. The Silurians as villains basically sum up the story as a whole. Beneath the surface, they're not as black and white as everything may seem. The old and young Silurian reflect both the Doctor and the Brigadier's characters. Both of them argue over leadership and the idea of peace. The old Silurian almost goes through the same arc as the Doctor does in this story, wary of the other side that he views as invaders, but is willing to have peace between the two species. The young Silurian is also practically the Brigadier, seeing the harm what both species can do with each other, and thinks that one should be wiped out before the other does first, shoot first and ask questions later. We even see that despite the old Silurian proclaiming he is the leader and makes the decisions for his tribe, it proves to be his downfall as the young Silurian kills him. It shows that the leader is not stronger than the whole tribe, and the vocal majority outweigh the peaceful minority. Though even when the young Silurian becomes leader, he still has to reinforce his ideals through fear by shouting at his two subordinates and reminding them of his power. The Silurian voices by Peter Halliday are also pretty good. They sound distinctively alien and reptilian, but human enough that you can sympathise with them. And while I think the costumes are a bit rubbery at times, they're kept mostly in dimly lit light, so it's not that big of a problem when it comes to their appearance. I think also the Silurians represent the idea that aliens in Doctor Who can be good. While you can't really have a good Cyberman or a good Dalek, the Silurians represent the idea that there can be peace between two coexisting species, and not to judge a book by their covers. Unlike the Daleks or Cybermen that will kill or convert anything they see, the Silurians will only attack in self-defense, making them much more complex than a lot of other Doctor Who monsters at the time, and you almost feel sad that peace was unable to be made, as the worst of both sides were the ones that were mostly present and won the day in the end. The supporting cast in this story are also really good. Peter Miles makes the first of his three Doctor Who appearances as Dr. Lawrence, and I think his breakdown across the serial is very well portrayed, and it's very natural. His main concern isn't with the safety of his staff, but how well the research centre is running. Despite thinking more like a computer and a machine and wanting things to run to a schedule, he still feels fear and anger. He becomes more and more paranoid at units' interference as his power and authority is stripped away piece by piece until he reaches his breaking point in episode 6 when, when he succumbs to the Silurian play. He blames everyone but himself, thinks that everyone has been out to discredit him and ruin his career and even tries to physically throw the Brigadier out of his place but his inability to listen is his downfall, and he dies of the plague. Peter Miles sells the hell out of this role, and while the pompous leader would become a trait of the Pertwee era, Dr. Lawrence definitely feels like one of the more complex and fully rounded of them. Fulton Mackay as Dr. Quinn is also really good, and he's not necessarily evil, but he's more misguided. He wants to know more about the Silurians and their civilization, and agrees to help find the wounded Silurian, but becomes too greedy and keeps the creature prisoner until they promise to give him the knowledge that he wanted. The Silurians even acknowledge how clever Quinn is, but his thirst for knowledge was his downfall. The promise of potential gain outweighed the risk of angering the Silurians, and he is killed by them. Despite only being in three of the seven episodes, Fulton Mackay certainly makes an impact and the performance is really good. His relationship with Miss Dawson is also really well handled. She warns Quinn to tell someone about the discovery he's made, but he doesn't listen, and after he is killed, Miss Dawson is determined to see the Silurians wiped out. On first viewing, you might be confused as to why she'd want this extremity, but if you watch her scenes with Quinn again, you'll see that she did have affections for him, and wanted him to talk because she cared for him, and Thomasine Highness sells the hell out of this role, she's really good. Norman Baker is also similar to the Brigadier, playing Major Baker, in that he'd rather shoot first before asking questions later, but his rashness is his downfall, as despite being injured, he wants to fight them again. 
kind of ironic when you think about it. He was the first to suggest war between the two species, and that the Silurians wanted to invade Earth and wipe out humanity, and he helped cause that. He became the first to be infected with their plague that spread to humanity, just like the idea of kill or be killed that he suggests to everyone. Finally, we have Geoffrey Palmer as Masters. No, no, not the Master. That's his surname. Anyway, Masters is quite similar to the Doctor in that he's brought in by the Ministry, a high authority, and the Doctor was sent here by the Time Lords, also a higher authority. But like the Doctor, Masters is the middleman between two ideals, scientist Dr. Lawrence and the military unit. And like the Doctor, he's unable to come up with a solution and is sadly killed by the plague. Despite his short and brief role, I feel Jeffrey Palmer gave a very good performance as Masters. From a production standpoint, this episode looks fantastic. The cave sets are pretty convincing, though I think that it would have looked a lot better had they actually gone to real caves like they suggested, but they still look good thanks to some very well realised lighting. There's some great shots that obscure the look of the Silurians early on in the story, the way the hand comes out on the surface and the sun silhouetting its body looks amazing. Furthermore, the Silurian point of view shots are very effective. The heavy breathing really helps as well. And you get the sense that this creature isn't out to kill or cause any malicious intent. It's just helpless and only looking for shelter after being wounded. The shots of the moors look great as well, particularly when they hunt for the Silurian. It just looks so enormous and isolated. The montage of the plague affecting London is also really well handled. It adds to the chaos of it all, but also gives it a lot of scale. This is now a series that shows the viewer how close the danger is to home. Now, if I did have criticism of this story, it would be the dinosaur effect. While it's not as bad as the infamous Merca that we would get from Warriors of the Deep, it's still not a pretty strong effect. Luckily, it's not on screen for very long, and it's not hugely detrimental on the story, so... I'll forgive it. The music by Kerry Blyton is also a problem for me. He makes use of a crumb horn, and sadly, it sounds too unintentionally comical. It just doesn't fit the story at all and comes across as way too camp sounding. Now, there are some tracks I do like, such as when we see Squire's Farm in episode 2. It just sounds very tranquil and isolated, which makes sense as it's a farm and in a rural location though it kind of reminds me of the opening to Emmerdale a little. But when the Silurians appear, the music sadly undermines their appearance. It just makes them sound comical rather than scary, and it's just really distracting and out of place for me. But aside from the music, production-wise, this episode is pretty top-notch and continues with Doctor Who's high standard of Series 7. So, to conclude, Doctor Who and the Silurians is a wonderfully dark, Morally ambiguous story with great performances, well-rounded characters that's nicely shot with equally as complex monsters. The tone is bleak but never feels out of place, and the pacing is so good that you could watch this all in one go and never feel bored by it. While the music is sadly very out of place tone-wise, the direction definitely makes up for it with excellent atmosphere and scale. It's easily one of the Third Doctor's finest stories. Well everyone, that's all from me. Be sure to like, share and subscribe. Let me know in the comments below what you think of Doctor Who and the Silurians. And let me know, is this one of your favourite Third Doctor stories? Let me know what your favourite is and uh, I'll take a look. And I shall see you all next time. Goodbye.